Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of September 17th, 2018. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning, now from 6.20 to 7 a.m., for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. We post the podcast of our discussions following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, As the candidates for governor start settling into their campaign fiscal positions, we examine what they are. Second, we look at the question of how much did the Alaska legislature really approve in spending last session, and what does fiscal year 2020 look like? And third, we examine AGDC's recent agreement with Exxon. How far does it push the project forward? At the end, we also include a discussion we had with Michael during a break about Peter Machicki's recent election year conversion to PFD Defender. And now, let's join Michael. Brad Keithley is our guest. He is with Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget, which is an organization obviously dedicated to trying to get us to a sustainable, I don't know why it's so hard to get us to a sustainable budget level, but it just seems to always be it is. Uh, Brad Keithley joins us this morning. Good morning, Brad. How are you? Michael, I'm doing great. How about you today? You know, I have uh, I have very few complaints uh, because nobody listens anymore anyway, so it's all it's all good. Um, I, I'd like to hit you this morning. We've got our uh, we've got our, our normal thing that we do, which is your weekly top three, which are the top three things that seem to you know that we really need to be taking a look at each and every week around the state of Alaska. Now, for folks out there who don't know Brad, he's a former oil and gas consultant and attorney who's retired now, but really you know uses that kind of analytical expertise to look at things like state budgets and how oil and gas and how politics play into all this. Your weekly top three this morning, uh, Brad, starts with uh, candidates. And their fiscal positions, which is always kind of that's always a fun thing with any candidate. What uh, what let's let's take a crack at number one here. Well, as the as the campaign gets going and and, and candidates are appearing in various forums, uh, their fiscal issues, their fiscal positions are getting uh, better defined. There was a good article last week in the Juno Empire. James Brooks uh, covered a, a a forum that had occurred down in Ketchikan. Uh, and did a really good job, I think, of summarizing the, summarizing the three candidates' uh, positions. And and I think it's important for for people to understand these positions. Certainly, as they as they make decisions on the candidates, Governor Walker said early on that this race is going to be decided on on fiscal issues, on spending issues, on budget issues, on the PFD. Uh, and I think he's right about that. And so we need to understand the candidate's position. James uh, uh, went, James Brooks' article went through the the what the candidates had said at the forum, and and it was enlightening in part because of James's bias, frankly, as as he came into the article, uh, as he's as he's setting up the discussion about these positions, uh, he he started by saying uh, the three differed most sharply on their approaches to Alaska's estimated seven hundred million dollar budget deficit. Well, it's not seven hundred million dollars. It if you if you apply the full stat the statute. On the PFD, the full budget deficit that, that we've got, taking t- setting aside the money that should be set aside for the PFD under the statute, the full deficit that we've got is about a billion six, uh, not 700 million. We've filled they filled up 900 million of that by diverting money from the PFD, but it's a billion six. So you start, you should start analyzing uh, the various candidates' positions by by looking at that billion six. And, and frankly, it's even more a little bit more than a billion six. If you look at the latest analyses 
that have come out from the legislative finance division, uh, politicians would tell you that they spent about $4.5 billion uh, this last session. We'll dig into this a little bit more in the second segment, but what they really spent was $4.8 billion uh, now, that, now that legislative finance has gone through all the numbers. So once you add that on, the deficit's really a $1.9 billion. Um, and, and so you really you, you need to have that in your mind as you start analyzing these positions. Isn't this, though, isn't this like debate and argument 101? If you could set the playing field, if you can frame the question in your favor to begin with, I mean, you've won half the battle. I mean, that, and that's kind of where we're at right now. They're, and this has been the problem that we've had for years in dealing with the legislature, not just this one, but many past legislatures, is that they always do these things and they frame it in, in issues like this. And my biggest one, for example, is do we have a revenue problem or a spending problem? They always automatically frame it as a revenue problem versus a spending problem. One question, though. Uh, we know that the accounting for the permanent fund has changed in your discussions in this number of $1.9 billion. Um, how would that have changed if they had gone back to the old accounting for the PFD? How would that affect that number? Well, it, it, it inc I'm not sure I quite understand the question, but it increases the deficit to account for uh, I mean, the, 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 the Permanent Fund Corporation no longer publishes numbers that, that look at the, at the statutory net income. Okay. They, they, they switched that after SB 26. And so you have to sort of dig back into it. But, but looking at the PFD as it should have been, uh, the PFD should have been uh, uh, about, uh, oh, about a billion, five billion, six billion, seven, somewhere in there. And and all they all we paid out was about eight hundred million of that. So, so okay. it, it adds that nine hundred that nine hundred uh, additional billion. You know, and again, this uh, the, the, I I've, I like James Brooks's reporting on a lot of things, but this is just another example of how we don't have kind of this non biased, investigative, skeptical of skeptical of the facts given. You know what I mean? Ske especially when they're coming from partisan sources. Uh, I think we need to have more skeptical, uh, you know, uh, uh, more skeptical looks at a lot of this stuff. And we're just not seeing it anymore. And I mean, even buying into these numbers like the 44 percent cuts and 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 as you just pointed out, talking about what they actually spent and everything else. Uh, that's part of the problem that we have today is we don't have this kind of deep dive reporting. Yeah, we, we don't. And. And, and the 700 million uh, is bothersome from a lot of from a lot of standpoints. Governor Walker says, "Well, I've closed the deficit down to 700 million, um, and and so it's just going to take a little bit more. I mean, it was two plus billion when I started. I've closed it down to 700 million. It's just going to take a little bit more. Let me have another term, and I'll get that other 700 million uh, taken care of." Is basically the theme that. That, that Walker's pursuing. But that assumes, I mean, that $700 million assumes that the violation of the statute that occurred to divert PFD money over to the, over to the, uh, over to the state revenue side um, uh, just continues. And, and the $700 million assumes that that $900 million that was, that was taken from the PFD, stolen from the PFD, if you, if you, if you take the statute as law, as people should, uh, that, seven, that $900 million that was stolen from the, from the PFD just continues. So you, you have to really look at the true baseline that we're starting with. And as I say, it's the, it's the $700 million plus $900 million that was diverted from the PFD, and you go back to the Legislative Finance Division, look at the numbers they did, you have to add on another $200 million to that. And so we're at a $1.9 billion uh, uh, that, we're starting, that we're starting with. Walker says, we just want to keep going down the same track. We want to close that $700 million, uh, presumably through some form uh, of taxes. That's, that's basically how Walker has, Walker's position has evolved. Begich says, I want to back up. I want to do the PFD differently. I want to do a uh, percent of market value, POMV, as, as is in Senate Bill 26, uh, which would reduce uh, the amount of the PFD from the current statute. Um, and then divide that POMV draw 50-50 uh, between the, the PFD and, and state government. That's better than Walker's position, uh, but it's still not, still not the current statute. And, that's, and that leaves a hole uh, that, that Begich then says we have to fill through, uh, quote, new revenues, uh, which is the code word for taxes. And then you get to Dunleavy, and Dunleavy's position is 
uh, that that we can continue spending about four billion dollars on the operating budget. It's now it's come down from four point three down to about four, uh, uh, as as he's as as Mike's saying in in the current forums. Uh, but that's still way too high. I mean, if if you if you look at the at the four point seven uh, that that actually got or four point eight that actually got spent. Uh, and you redu- and and you look at the amount of revenues we got. We can't support uh, a, a four billion dollar budget and continue paying a full PFD. So I, we, we've got we've got three positions out there. Two of which say that explicitly say that we need new revenues, and Dunleavy's, which by spending too much and saying that we're going to continue to draw on things like the CBR, it is essentially walking us into. Uh, new revenues because it will drain out the fiscal reserves at a time we ought to be starting to add back to them. So we, uh, I'm hopeful for additional evolution in these fiscal positions as we as we get further in the campaign. But right now we have three positions that are starkly different, have starkly different starting points, um, and frankly, right now if you look at all three of them, none of them uh, uh, really work. Uh, if what you're trying to do is is reduce the cost of government uh, and uh, and limit the amount of uh, of new revenues that uh, that the state has to pull on, sounds like our options so far are horrible, terrible, and terrifying. Those are kind of the three, you know. Uh, I mean, because and again, we've seen again the the number from Dunleavy has evolved a little bit. It was four point three after some some discussions with him. It's come down to four. I'm hoping that you're right, that it evolves down to 3.8 or something like that, because we all know that with capital and, you know, capital and everything else, uh, deferred maintenance and, and everything, it will be closer to four, even if you get it down to three, seven. And I know some of your numbers say that that sustainable number is what? Three, seven, five. Three, seven, five. So even at three, seven, five, we know that now, does that include capital or is that just uh, general general fund spending? <laughs> No, that's that's cap, that's capital. That's that's UGF unrestricted general funds uh, operating and capital combined. So we're and yeah, frankly, Michael, that three that three point seven five is on the is on the top side uh, of a range. We don't have. I mean, people. I know people talk about uh, that that oil prices are recovering, and I know that we talk about oil productions recovering, and those are great. But but three point seven five is about where that gets us, and that, that sort of tells you how bad off we were. Uh, that that we're in this recovery and we're getting we're getting up to that range, but we're not back at the four the four billion dollar range. Right. All right. So that's so again horrible, ter- terrible, and terrifying. Those are your three choices. Three point five would actually be better than anything else. It would put us closer to that three seven five with capital spending. Uh, let's move on to number two. How much did the legislature? You you just mentioned it. They say they did this. They say they did that. How much did they really approve in the spending? Let's get a crack at it before we have to take a break here. So legislative finance did an analysis uh, that comes out in September that takes a hard, cold look uh, at the budget as it as it finally came out uh, of the legislature, looks at the spending side, looks at the revenue side. Uh, and they came out with that in the last couple of weeks. And it's really it's eye opening uh, to look at it. Now, if you look at 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 the numbers that, that James Brooks and others were looking at, they were looking at the operating budget number. And at first blush, it looked like the operating number was about four point five billion dollars. That's what that's what the analyses right after the legislature uh, finished up uh, were trying to were trying to tell you. But the but what the legislature did was they passed a budget in the appropriations bill, and then they pa- passed a couple of statutes. SB, HB three thirty one is one of those, but passed a couple of statutes that added to the appropriations bill, re- required or provided for additional spending uh, beyond the appropriations, the normal appropriations bill. So that 4.5 operating budget that people were talking about at the end of the session, once you add in those additional um, uh, uh, statutes uh, and, and the authorizations that came in the statutes, that 4.5 grows to about 4.66, uh, upwards of, of, of about 4.7. That's just the operating side. Uh, and then when you add in capital, the capital the first time uh, on first blush at the end of the session was about $150, billion, $150 million. That totaled up to a total budget of about $4.7 uh, billion, all in. That's first blush after the end of the session. But then when you add in 
uh, the additional, uh, the effect of the additional statutes, that 4.7 becomes 4.83. Uh, so the all-in number operating in capital, and, the, and this is just unrestricted general funds, uh, the all-in number operating in capital uh, uh, that, that came out of the last session is 4.84, rounding up slightly, uh, 4.84 billion dollars, uh, an increase of roughly 400 million dollars from the all-in number from FY uh, 2017. So, or FY 2018. Right. And so, it, it, well, and that, 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 hold that thought. Uh, just uh, you got the head of steam going. I don't want you to lose this because then I want to talk about. Uh, then I want to talk about some designated funds and some. We got to get down into the real number here. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. We are up against the break. I'm a slave to the clock. Back with more. Don't go anywhere. We return with more right after these messages. The Michael Duke Show. Your home for common sense, liberty-based, free-thinking radio. There's no better person in my mind to get down into those details than our friend Brad Keithley with Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. Uh, He is the director and founder of that organization. Before we went to break, we were just talking with Brad about what the actual spending number is. And this is always kind of an amorphous thing, Brad. You were talking about how when they factored these things out, they, uh, you know, they, they kind of tell us, oh, we did this, we did that. But it always seems to be just a half truth. They never tell us the full amount. You were going into it and saying the, the final thought as you as we went into break was four point eight four bill or four point eight six billion dollars was being spent. And that was just in UGF, HB 331, some of these other things. But I think it actually gets worse than that, does it not? Well, by the time you add up uh, UGF, which is unrestricted general funds, that's the number that we typically talk about when we're talking about um, uh, state budget numbers. That's the discretionary funds that the that the state is spending. That's what's funded by oil taxes and, and oil royalties and that sort of thing. Uh, but there are two other pots of money. There are desi- well, three other pots of money, but but two other that affect state spending. One is designated general funds, and that is supposed to be uh, funds that have put, been put aside uh, in various pots in the past uh, to produce revenues, to be invested, produce revenues, or, or in some other way, produce revenues to be added to uh, the UGF. Um, and, then, and then what's called other state funds. Uh, and in that category this year, uh, they put uh, the, the borrowings that they project to make uh, for HB 331, the old tax credit uh, bond bailout, uh, they uh, they added those funds that they project to borrow. So by the time you add uh, to the 4.8, you add DGF, designated general funds. Uh, that's another roughly billion dollars, so you're up to $5.8 billion. And then you add the other state funds, which are the HB, largely the HB 331 funds, and that comes out to about 6.5. That's about another 700 million, 750 million. So you're up to about 6.5 billion dollars in just state spending. And then, and then you layer on the federal funds, the funds that come in from the federal government that are for in designated purposes, right. um, and that adds another uh, three some billion dollars. But state spending. Uh, counting the 331 funds is about seven. Total state spending is about 7.5 billion dollars. Now, and of course, we know that the legislature also played some accounting games. They short funded uh, some of the Medicaid payments and some other things. So, on top of all that, there's going to have to be a supplemental budget in the ne- in the beginning of the next session, which means that'll actually be on this year's t- uh, bill. And so it'll be even higher. I mean, I just can anybody just give me a bottom line number, please. Can you just stop playing all the accounting <laughs> games and just give me a number that is an actual number that we can we can. But see, this is how they do it. Oh, we cut this. We get this is the you know Walker's magical forty four percent cut number. I mean, this is the kind of games that people are tired of politicians playing. Well, and it, and it gets worse. I mean, you're talking about Medicaid. There are some other things. Uh, let it, you, you think I get down in the weeds. The, the people who really get down in the weeds is the legislative finance division at the at the legislature. There's another ledge finance report that came out late in August uh, that I just find fascinating, and that report is 
Um, here's the things that we sort of sloughed on this year. Here's the things that we paid out out of another pot of money, but really should have been paid out of UGF, and we're going to have to pay out of UGF uh, uh, going forward. Or here are the things that we short funded, like Medicaid, me- Medicaid, and uh, and we're going to have to catch up next year. That analysis uh, shows that there's another 200 million dollars that has to be has to be layered on. In the FY uh, 2020 budget, the budget that they'll do next legislative session, $200 million just to hold even with what they say they spent this last session. So <laughs> the real the real number, uh, the FY 2020 number uh, that, 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 that they're going to start with, the legislature is going to start with, if they say they just want to hold, hold, sol- hold solid with what they did last year, is $5 billion total operating plus capital five billion dollars that's just to hold even that's before you add on things like additional capital projects or additional spending that they might want to do uh, on the operating side five billion dollars now so when when candidates walk around and tell you well we held it at 4.5 billion dollars you know we've made all these these cuts and we can't go any deeper well what they what the, what they what they're really trying to what they really should be telling you is is five billion dollars that you guys have pro, worth of programs that you've committed to that you're starting with uh, in the next legislative session. I, I mean, mean that makes that makes Dunleavy's four billion dollars just his four billion dollars seem like a huge step. That's 20, that's a twenty percent reduction uh, in one year from where they really uh, from, from where the budget really is. And when you talk about you really need to get down to 3.75, you can you can see this huge gap uh, that we still that we're still dealing with in this state um, six years after uh, we started into uh, into this fiscal crisis. You know we're in a crisis and nobody seems to. I mean they 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 pay lip service to it, but it just seems like when the rubber meets the road, nobody has the. And, and I think part of it is that they believe. They fully believe that if they cut government, it would damage the economy even further. They're not even taking into account what's going on out in the economy. I'll be honest with you. I have never talked to as many business owners as I have in the last four or five weeks. I've talked to a lot of business owners uh, on some different stuff and, and different things that I'm doing. And I will tell you right now, I have never seen it so down uh, in my entire adult life, as far as dealing with numbers and things like that, they just seem to lack the capacity to understand that they have got to live within their means because it is killing the economy. Final thoughts on number two. Well, we've, we've got a huge bu- budget crisis. It has not been solved. We have not cut the budget. As I say, if you just look at the $4.8 billion dollars, that ledge finance now tells us the legislature spent the last session. That's an increase of $300 million, nearly $400 million from what we spent just the year before. Um, Almost uh, approaching 10%, approaching 9% uh, increase uh, just on UGF. And if you look at what ledge finance is telling us what we have to spend in 2020, just to hold even $5 billion, that's a, that's a, Four and a half, uh, four hundred and fifty million dollar increase from from uh, FY uh, twenty eighteen. That is a full ten percent. So right. we're we're going up. We're, right. we're not we're not we're not even holding even. We're going up. Right. Uh, we're down to the last four and a minutes or so here, Brad. Unfortunately, we always seem to do this. So Brad and I love to do this for hours. Uh, unfortunately, we're we are slaves to the clock. Let's talk about number three, which of course is the big announcement from the Walker administration that they've pushed an agreement forward with Exxon uh, on the a, on the uh, gas line, Alaska LNG. What does this do for us? Uh, uh, you know, what is what is what happens? How far does this agreement go? Well, I think there's two things to be said about that. Exxon does not do things randomly. They don't do things uh, for political show. Um, and so I think that's a real agreement and a real step uh, on the supply side uh, from the standpoint of this project. I think it's Exxon saying, uh, yes, we think this structure, if we're going to be able to do this project, this structure is the right way to do it with the state uh, in an ownership position. Uh, owning the uh, the kit uh, uh, between the field and the and the LNG terminal, uh, and we and it's Exxon saying we think that's the right structure. We're gonna we're gonna back that. We're gonna put our supplies behind that. I think from a supply standpoint, 
that's a huge plus and it's a step forward and I think we ought to recognize it for that. That doesn't mean this project's a go. We've still got this huge problem uh, on the market side. The market uh, for LNG, for new LNG uh, plants in the Pacific Rim is China. You can't do an LNG project without having a big deal with China. We have the memorandum of understanding or the memorandum of agreement with China, but that, frankly, if you if you if you look through all the words, that really is not much. Uh, has to be filled out, and in the midst of this trade war uh, that that the U.S. and China have 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 launched against each other, and frankly, according to the headlines of the day, is now getting worse. Uh, uh, in 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 the trade the the trade dispute is getting worse. Uh, I think it's unrealistic to think we're going to reach final agreements, uh, final mark, uh, uh, financeable agreements with China uh, before this trade war is resolved. So big step with Exxon. Uh, need, to, need to give credit to, uh, to the project for being able to, to reach that agreement with Exxon. Need to give credit to Exxon uh, uh, or need to give some significance to Exxon's step, but doesn't anywhere approaching mean that we've got the deal done because right. we don't have a market side. Right. Well, I mean, we've also got the big announcements coming out of Qatar that the China LNG deal is going through with Qatar, Exxon, Total, and they've all agreed to develop and expand the, the LNG supply to China, which again puts more pressure on whether or not this project is viable. 60 seconds, Brad, your final thoughts. Big market in China. Big market in China. Big opportunity in China. Uh they can they can absorb they're going to need to absorb things like a cutter deal maybe a, 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 a another deal from uh, from Africa uh, they can absorb those sorts of deals and still have room for Alaska LNG but we're not going to get the Alaska LNG prog- uh, 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 project done uh, agreed to with China until the trade war is resolved and if that drags on it's going to drag the LNG project with it. Twenty five seconds, Brad. What can people do out there to try and fix this? Keep talking to your representatives they're, they're, or to your candidates. There's no better time to deal with candidates. They don't. They they, they listen most during a campaign. So keep saying, uh, cut the budget. Evaluate their budget positions. Tell them if they don't, if they're not standing for cutting the budget, you're not voting for them. Ask them about the PFD. The PFD is really the key issue uh, on the on the private sector side. If they're in favor of cutting the PFD, they favor government over the private sector. If they want to go back to the statute, they favor the PF, they favor the private sector. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budget. You can find links on my Facebook page and more. Brad, thanks for coming in and joining us. We are out of time this morning. Thanks for being part of it. Don't go anywhere. The Michael Duke Show, your home for Common Sense Radio. All righty. Brad, uh, thanks for coming in. Yeah, Harold is uh, Harold is having an aneurysm in the chat room. He says the <laughs> he says the Alaska LNG is a nothing burger. Uh, Qatar Exxon twenty two year with LNG for China. It again, and I mean I agree with him in part because you know it's the bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. They could keep talking about Alaska gas, but with all these other questions and the China tariff war going on. I mean, how, you know, what's the probability of this actually moving forward, I think, is the biggest question. Well, I think I, I, there, there's a huge market in China. I mean, they're trying to get off coal. They're moving off coal. When you look at the uh, at the analyses, Rystad, which is a great uh, Norwegian consulting firm, did a recent analysis of of China demand versus you know the supply they've signed up, and they so they show a huge uh, a huge opening in terms of supply opportunities. Uh, the opportunity is there, and, and Alaska uh, certainly can fit into that opportunity, and it's a solution to the trade to the trade issue for the Chinese. Uh, if they're going to get a resolution with this administration on trade, uh, they've got to do several things, but one of them is to buy a lot more uh, U.S. goods uh, to, to help balance the trade. Alaska could be a big chunk of that. So I don't think the Chinese commit to – to filling in that gap uh, unless they sort of give up hope that we're ever going to resolve the trade issue. They need to keep uh, that that opening there as long as they're trying to resolve the trade issue uh, because doing a deal with Alaska would fill, would fill a large chunk of it. So I, the, the opportunity is there. I was very bullish on it 
uh, when uh, when when Trump started the trade war, uh, thinking that this was going to be a quick resolution with Alaska being a big part of the deal. As the trade war is sort of mushroomed into other things, I think the timing of the trade of the trade resolution is as stretched out. But I still think at the end of the day, when they get that thing resolved, that Alaska Alaska is is part of it, and I think the Chinese will hold it hold a market segment for that. I've, I've been around this industry for 30, well, almost 40 years now. I've been actively involved in a lot of LNG deals. Uh, I've been actively involved in, a, in, in boardroom thinking of a lot of these, of a lot of the companies. Um, and, and I've seen uh, uh, these sorts of things, how they, the forces that bring them together, the forces that pull them apart. There's a big force in pulling the Alaska LNG project together. A lot of steps you have to go through, but a big force in pulling it together. The trade trade imbalance with the U.S. is a big part of that. Um, and I remain hopeful, but the timing on it has just been, in all fairness, shot to hell by the by the trade dispute uh, between the Trump administration and China, and it's going to take a while to sort that out. I uh, we've got we've got a couple minutes here, and so I'm going to abuse my guests or my uh, listeners a little bit here because I you know you and I don't get a chance to talk nearly as much as we used to. I, I think we do have to do an after hours here where we can get down into some of these numbers, uh, specifically on the fiscal plans from the candidates. Um, I'll be honest, I'm really concerned. Um, again, the the evolution and the rotation in discussions. Uh, you know, we, I kind of expected it from baggage. I thought Walker would hold true because this is the this is the line he has to hold to. Otherwise, he sinks. Uh, there's just no other way to it. Uh, Dunleavy, I was pleased to see him stop talking about 4.3 and get closer to 4. Uh, I know that you've had some conversations with him uh, and some numbers crunching, uh, you know, in regards to this. Any, you know, any movement or word or further questions or anything from the Dunleavy uh, campaign or administration on – on on those numbers, on your three point seven, three point five to three point seven magical numbers. No, no, uh, not really. And 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 Dunleavy, this is this is a dangerous thing. Dunleavy, in my view, is being driven more by political considerations. He doesn't want to answer the question, "Where would you make the cuts?" Uh, because he because he's concerned about saying, if you say the university, you put that segment of the voters at risk. If you say K through twelve, you you raise that. He doesn't want to say where he's going to make the cut. So rather than have, rather than try to sort of deal with that in a in a more amorphous way, he's just upped his budget number where he can say we don't have to make cuts. Right. We can have a full PFD. We can have uh, spending uh, and and sort of keep spending at normal levels. Although as we talked about the the Ledge Finance Division numbers show it's not we're not even close to being at normal levels. But 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 where you can say that. And that's a political consideration. And the problem is the day after you get elected, uh, then all of a sudden you have to fess up and say, oops, well it's not really four. Uh what I really meant to say was three point five or three point seven five. And then you've got to confront uh oh, either either Additional cuts that are going to, you know, sort of make people very uh, skeptical about about your truthfulness during the campaign, or you've got to confront that you got to come up with new revenues, and and that's just not going to be a comfortable position to be in. But I think they've made, I think the campaigns made the conscious decision that they're going to try to glide through, as 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 one reporter put it, run out the clock on the election by sticking to this four number and saying we can have it all. Uh, and then and then glide through the election and then, you know, fess up after that. Well, and I think that there's probably also a lot of pressure after Treadwell had to crash and burn on, on that campaign from the kind of the, the Chamber of Commerce uh, element of this, where they definitely don't want to see a lot of that government spending cut because that's their gravy train in a lot of ways. Uh, is those excess contracts and things like that. So, uh, Brad, thanks so much for coming on board. We, uh, we're we uh, we're out of time here. I'm about uh, 45 seconds out. Thanks for coming on board. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Uh, since we're in the break and we're uh, we're moving forward, uh, maybe you can – and maybe we can ask you about this on the other side too if we have enough time. Uh, your reaction to the announcement from District 31 that uh, – uh, that Peter Machicki has teamed up, quote unquote, with Clem Tillian to form this legacy PFD protection, yada yada yada. What is your What is your thoughts on uh, uh, on on that uh, this morning? So uh, 
Oh, uh, my thoughts this morning are the same <laughs> as, as the first time I heard it. So uh, it's great that that people are talking about an act. Uh, Dunleavy's talked about it a long time. Even Mark Begich is talking about it. Yes, we certainly ought to do that. But but for Peter Bacecki to now claim he's a PFD convert uh, is just laughable. I, I went back over the weekend for some other stuff I'm doing. Uh, and sort of dug out some some past uh, uh, Machiki quotes. There's one after in the Anchorage Daily News after Governor Walker had vetoed the PFD the first time uh, back in 2016, and it's Machiki praising Governor Walker's courage uh, for uh, engaging in uh, for 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 cutting the PFD. Machiki said yes, the Senate had just done it uh, in a in a Senate bill that was then bound uh, running around in the in uh, 2016, and, and, and but the House hadn't passed it, but Pacecki was praising Governor Walker for having gone through with it. And then I found another clip, Pacecki talking on the floor in 2017 um, uh, when he was voting for uh, SB 26 that, that at that time uh, explicitly cut the PFD. Um, and Macecki talking about, you know, profiles and courage, and he was going to stand up, and this was the right thing to do to cut the PFD, and he would explain it to his constituents, and leadership called for action sometime. And this goes on for about 10 minutes. Um, and so we get to 2018, and now Macecki is in the middle of an election. Uh, Gillum almost beat him in the primary. Gillum's going to run against him uh, on a, on a write-in, uh, sort of like Lisa Murkowski. And, and Macecki all of a sudden has had this election year conversion. The the thing about election year conversion, I remember when Kathy Giesel in 2016 had an election year conversion, right? She would voted to cut the PFD, and then as we get into the election, she, she did this ad. She and her husband did this ad about how she's going to save the PFD, and it was wrong of Governor Walker to veto it, and, and, and citizens needed to have that PFD, needed to have reliability of it. After she got elected in 2017, she voted to cut it again. Right. Um, so election year conversions just aren't very impressive to me. Well, and and I think the the, the profiles and courage comment I thought was pretty interesting from Machiki. I watched that I've watched that clip on the floor. Uh, you know, kind of this analogous analogizing himself to George W. Bush and the Great Tax Compromise and everything else. Uh, and then he finishes that whole thing up with, uh, "I will face the voters come re-election time." Oh, he sure did. He sure did. Uh, I mean, that was kind of thing. I will face my constituents and kind of I will face the music if that's what it takes. And um, <clears throat> you saw what happened. <laughs> you saw what happened. You are going to face the music when it uh, when it comes down to it. And you see how people and boy, I tell you what, social media and I don't care if it's a political group or not, uh, like a Facebook uh, political group. They are killing him over this. I mean, the the, the commentary is overwhelmingly like eighty five percent, just 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 kicking the hell out of him online. Uh, I think that there's going to be a big groundswell. It's going to be interesting to watch how this uh, write in uh, uh, plays out. It, it is, and and it's going to be. I mean, Gil, kill him demonstrated during the primary. He doesn't need much money. Uh, behind him, uh, Machecki outspent him by a huge, a huge amount. But uh, Gillum's out there, and he's doing the same thing. He's continuing, and the voting group expands. Right, it, it expands to include right. libertarians, people who are registered in the Libertarian Party. Uh, it expands to include people who are registered Democrats. It expands to include independents who didn't participate uh, in the Republican primary. And there's no other opposition to Machecki, so it's really a one-on-one race with this expanded voting group. And I, you know, I, it, it, if Gillum can dig in and do the work, uh, given what happened in the primary, I think he's got a chance. And this, I, you cannot, you cannot trust election year conversions. If Kathy Giesel taught us nothing else, you cannot trust uh, election year uh, conversions. So I, I take Machecki at what, at the word, at the words he was using in 2016, when he called, PFD cuts courageous. Uh, I take the I take him at the words he used in 2017 when he wasn't facing voters uh, and said it was the right thing to do that he was going to exercise leadership. I don't take him at the word that he's exercising during election campaign election campaign in 2018. Brad Keithley is our guest. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages. 
and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.